series. Here's the thing I just want to say out loud. If, if you're a person who uh, believes that every message in church needs to be deeply theological, then today you may struggle a little bit. But here's, here's what I think happens sometimes. I think sometimes when we get into a Mary series, we, we, we kind of set the standard. We talk about kind of this perfect world of what it's supposed to be like. And, and you hear and you go, okay, I'm supposed to die for my spouse. I'm supposed to submit all my needs. And we begin to talk about these things. And we go, I mean, man, I, I, I don't know that any of us fully measures up because what we're talking about are the, the goals, the aspirations, the, the place we're headed within the relationship and to strive for all the time. And today we just want to take a few moments and just say, look, uh, let's talk about some practical stuff. Let's talk about some things that you and I could put in place and you and I could do that have the capacity to have profound impact uh, on our lives. And, and here's the bottom line. You, what we're going to talk about today is you and I have been called to love our spouse. What does that look like? What, what does it mean to take that love, put it in practical terms so that our spouse knows that we love them and receives what we're doing as love in their lives? And so super, super practical, maybe not super, super deep, but we think we're going to change a conversation, we're going to change a language, and actually give you the opportunity to go home and say, okay, okay, so tell me about that in your life, and potentially really, really change the, direct, the direction and the trajectory of your relationship on the deal. So here, let me ask you this question. Here, here's start. The last time you felt deeply loved, the last time you just said, wow, I, I mean, I know that person cares for me. You know, w w was it a touch on the shoulder? Was it something they said? Was it something they did for you? And so I'm honest, I'm just going to ask you to think about that for a moment. Just what was, what was, what happened? What was said? What was done the last time that your heart said, wow, wow, that person really cares? For me. What was that in your life? Now here's the interesting thing. If I were to go take a survey right now, if I were to ask you to raise hands, say, okay, so what was it? What was that last moment? Describe that to me. You get that in this room, we would end up with a myriad of different answers. And as we began to express it, and somebody would say, you know what? I, I, I was just going through a rough time in my life, and, and someone came up and, and simply just placed their hand on my shoulder, and, and I, I knew. And they would say, and, and that was just the most loving thing that possibly could have happened in that moment. Here's the interesting part. Someone else in the room would have said, really? If someone had done, I wouldn't have thought anything of it. I would have just thought, oh, well, that was, you know, being courteous. I, I, I wouldn't have received that as some grand loving gesture. See, some of us in the room would say, well, you know, it was just this little gift I was given. It was just this little thing, and someone thought, took the time to think of me when we weren't together. And I mean, I, I just thought, wow, now I know. Now I know. And some of us would go, they gave you a little porcelain piece of crud? What? What? That was loving? I, I don't get it. You get that in this room we would have very, very different reactions to exactly the same moment. And what, we're, what would be happening in that moment is we would be describing different love languages, that there are actually completely different ways in which we receive love, that what speaks to one person, a language, a love language that speaks to one person, wouldn't mean anything to us. And the idea is simply this, that we receive love so differently from other people potentially that it is different as a language is different. That, that, that someone may be speaking French and, and I am only hearing English. And as long as your gestures of love and as long as your expressions of how you feel about me are French, I, I, am, I don't care how good they are, I don't care how articulate you are in French, I'm never going to hear them in English. Because I have a different love language from you. It's interesting. Uh, some of you know, Lisa and I adopted one of the little gals from the orphanage uh, there in Kenya. And we try to get over there a couple times a year and just hang out. She's now gotten married and our son-in-law, Jimmy, 
and uh, inevitably as you get over there, they've been, they've been speaking Swahili uh, the whole time. So for the first about day, day and a half, we're riding along in the car, and they'll be sitting in the back seat speaking Swahili, laughing in Swahili. And uh, inevitably, Lisa, because it frustrates her even worse, Lisa will turn and say, all right, all right, look, we're done. We're done. From now on, as long as Dad and I are here till we leave and get on the plane and go again, this is an English-only zone. You, you can't speak, in, matter of fact, and she would even say, she wouldn't say it to them, but she would say to me, Lynn, it just, it, it almost feels rude when we're together that they're speaking Swahili and they know we don't understand. And, and, and imagine this moment. Imagine that Lisa turns to our kids and says, hey, look, English only zone, you got to speak in English. And imagine for a moment that their response was to simply speak Swahili louder. <laughs> it's an interesting response because here's what happens sometimes. Sometimes you and I are in relationships with our spouse, and our spouse is saying, look, 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 I, I just don't even feel loved. I'm not, I'm not, I, I, I just don't get it from you. And in that moment, you and I are speaking the wrong love language, one that our spouse doesn't understand, and our response, our response is to speak it louder. And it doesn't work. And here's what I'm going to suggest today, that some of us are in relationships and you would say, Lynn, look, there's no reason for my spouse not to know that I love. I mean, I have tried so hard. I mean, some of the guys would say, look, I, that whole laying down your life for your wife, I feel like I have laid down my life a hundred times for her, and she is so unresponsive. She is so ungrateful for what I've done for her. Is it possible? Is it possible you're speaking French to her Spanish? That how you're expressing your love to her is either what you receive as love or maybe what you learned from your parents of how to express, and that it means absolutely no, she isn't hearing it. Because she speaks a different love language than you. Is it possible, ladies? that you, you've spent years trying to crack through to your husband and going, look, I, I don't know how to be more loving. I don't know how to do this. And it's almost as if every gesture I make toward him doesn't mean anything. Is it possible that he's not ungrateful? Is it possible he's not, he's not as rough and tough and unpenetrable as you think he is? that you're simply speaking the wrong love language to your man. And so here's what we're going to do. We're going to spend some time today. We're going to talk about this. Matter of fact, uh, there's a guy. He's a Christian counselor. His name is Gary uh, Chapman. He's written a book, and his argument is that there's really kind of five basic love languages uh, out there, and we're going to spend some time just going through that and seeing if this is uh, helpful for you and I. Because at the end of the day, yeah, let's get this. You and I are commanded to love our spouse. But how ineffective are we if we're loving them in a way that doesn't mean anything to them? You and I could be working really, really hard and being unbelievably ineffective. So here's what I'd ask us to do. I think this will be interesting for us. In the uh, rack in front of you, hopefully there are some pieces of paper. I'm going to encourage you to take those out today. Here's what I want you to do. Uh, on one column, on one side... If you simply write down, as we go through this, whatever, as we talk about these five love languages, which one is yours? And everybody's got at least one. Some people have two. Uh, one of my staff came up after her first hour and said, my wife says she has all five. Go for it. <laughs> uh, but chances are, guys, you've got one, maybe two of these as love languages. What would be those for you? But I think here's the second part, and I think maybe the more intriguing part. I'd like for you to write down what you believe your spouse's love languages are. Because how interesting would that be after the message is over, if we get done today, to go to your spouse and say, here's what I think your love languages are, and for them to go, no, not even close. It'd be an, it'd be an intriguing uh, moment. So I'm actually doing it now. Some of you are sitting there and you're going, "Well, Lynn, I'm single. Uh, so how does this work?" I'm just going to ask you guys because this is going to come invaluable for you. I'm going to ask you to consider a significant person in your life and just try to figure out who. What is that? You know. So maybe it's someone you dated in the past 
and that relationship went a little weird, and, and maybe this is an answer for that. I, whatever that is, I, and I know this sounds kind of weird, but maybe parent, it's been very intriguing for me, and I'm old, uh, to sit back and realize what my parents' love languages were, and that for years, as their son, I tried to convey love to them and go, I, I was speaking the wrong language. They, they, did, they didn't hear me very well in that moment. Single gals, or just parents in the room, you know what I think is really intriguing? What are your kids' love languages? Is it possible as a parent to love your kids with all of your hearts and then grow up to adulthood and go, my mom and dad didn't love me? Not because you didn't love them, but because you spoke the wrong language and every gesture you made was not received. What are your kids? Lisa and I on the, on the way over, actually in the car yesterday, we're saying, I want, you know, what do you think Josh's love language is? Okay, so all sorts of applications. I, just be curious to see where you come out. So here we go. We're going to go through the five. Hopefully these will be helpful for us. Here we go. Here, number one, here's what Gary uh, Chapman says. Uh, words of affirmation. Words of affirmation. For some people, people go, words, who cares? Who cares? You can say all you want, doesn't mean anything to me. Show me. But there are people who words of affirmation is a big deal. Now here's the deal. When you say it, you got to mean it. You can't be flipping it. But when you stop and when they can tell that you really considered it before you said it, suddenly words of affirmation just absolutely fill them up. Words like, I am so proud of you. I guarantee you we've got men in this room who waited their entire lives for their dad to say that once. For their wife to say that once. Because their love language is words of affirmation. How about, how about this, dads? For your kids to say that once. Words of affirmation. And there are people who just say, look, I, 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 don't buy me anything. Don't show, just if you would find the moment... To sit down, look me in the eyes, and just say, this is what you mean to me. This is, this is when I am proudest of you. This is, this is when you're my, this is when you're amazing in my life. Words of affirmation. Matter of fact, um, if you have your Bibles, go with me, because there's actually a verse that kind of talks about this a little bit. It's the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 25. If you're not real familiar, if you go to the center of your Bible... You're probably going to be in the book of Psalms or in the book of Jobs. Uh, don't stop there very long. It's not what you think. Um, but right after, right to the right of the book of Psalms, you're going to find this book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 25, uh, verse 11. Here's what it says. Wisest man in the world saying these words. Ready? A word aptly spoken. Just means a good word, a right word, the, the right word in the right moment. A word aptly spoken is like apples of gold in settings of silver. And you go, well, that sounds weird. No, 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 no. Think, think. Apples of gold, settings of silver. It's talking about the coolest thing in the house, the statement piece in the house. Lisa, for a lot of years, did interior decorating. A lot of times she'd come home and she'd say, I, I finished the room, here's the problem. I just don't have a statement piece. I don't have that thing when you walk in the room, you go, <gasps> and your eye gets attracted and you get drawn to, and you go, that's the statement piece. Here's what Solomon says. The right word, said at the right time, and I'm going to say especially, 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 if your spouse's love language is words of admiration, it can be the centerpiece. It can be the statement piece in their lives. And I'm just going to tell you, you saying what they mean and what they've done and how deeply fills them up. This is, this is one of my love languages. Years ago, I finished working at a church in Scottsdale, and they bought me a clock. Ugly clock. Ugly clock. I, the wood for this, I, I have, I've never seen that wood before or since. It, kind of a weird, brassy thing on the, it, ugly clock. There was a little plaque on the bottom. And in the plaque, uh, they wrote, 
Hey, uh, Lynn, you've been a teacher to us, a friend uh, when life was falling apart. You've been an example of how to live for Christ. Thank you for everything that you've invested in us. I'm just going to tell you, I hung that clock, that ugly clock in my office, 20 years. It broke, and I sent it out for repair. <laughs> it wasn't until 20 years later, uh, my friend came in, looked at the clock, and he said, you know the kids didn't write that. I did. And I threw it away. But I, you know, <laughs> hey, guys, ready? A word aptly spoken. And some of us have spouses who need to hear from us. And you go, Lynn, I'm just not a good, I don't care if you're a good talker. So you and I are commanded to love our, and that's their love language. Then you and I have got to find a way to articulate to them what they mean in our lives. Got to be able to find a way to say it. So here's the, if, if, if this may be your spouse, if you go, hey, I, I think this, this may be it. Uh, here's some suggestions. Praise them, but you got to mean it. See, they, they've got, they, they have to sense you've thought about this before you said it. Uh, write them a note. Yeah, can I, don't be surprised if that note ends up in their Bible. Or if they put it away in a drawer. Or if they hang it on a wall as a clock. So write, just write and say, I, I just, I just want to express to you and tell you what you mean to my life. Hey guys, when I get a card... I, I don't care all the blah, 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 blah. I don't, I don't read any of that. You know what I look for every time when I get a card? Did they write me a sentence when they signed it? Words of affirmation. And then finally, compliment them in public. That's a big deal. See, you, you chose to say what I meant to you, and you chose to say it out loud where others could hear. Huge to people whose love language is words of affirmation. Okay, love language number two, quality time. Quality, this is just, look, I, I, I just want us to be able to spend time together. And here's what you need to get. This isn't about fancy, and this isn't about exotic, and this isn't about we have to travel. This is just about I want you to make yourself available to me. And, and here's how you know if your spouse likes quality time, is if they ask you to do dumb stuff with them. Uh, husbands, this is your wife who says, hey, when you come home, could we sit down on the couch and talk? And you're going, what? And you know what she's asking for? She's asking for quality. Well, what are you going to talk about? No, no, she's asking for quality time. I had a husband came to me and says, you know what? I, I just go grocery shopping with my wife. I don't do anything. I push the cart. I look kind of dumb. It's the best moment in her day. But you know why? Because quality time. It's, it's this idea of being available to your spouse. So it, it, it can be, guys, it can, even, it can be going to the movies. It can be going for a walk. It's not what it is. It's that you and I made ourselves available to them. Quality time. Matter of fact, uh, there's actually a verse. I won't make you go there, but it's an interesting thing. The Bible says that David was a man after God's own heart. And David, in describing himself, said this, Every morning, every morning I seek after you, God. What's he talking about? He's saying, every morning I have set a time, time, the beginning of my schedule, the beginning of my day, I reserve for God. And if your spouse's love language is quality time, then you need to know that this idea of reserving time for them is going to touch their heart. You know, it's also interesting of the five love languages, God actually asked you and I for four of them. Specifically in Scripture, he says, will you do this for me? Okay? Ladies, even if this is not your man's primary love language, even if it's not, I'm going to tell you that it still rates with your man. And here's why. In the very same way that women bond over conversation, men bond over activity. And so even if it's not his primary, I guarantee you it's one of the ways in which he engages and relates. Think, think about this, okay? Think about you're seeing an interview with a man, and as he's talking about uh, people he loves and people he'd give his life for, and a tear begins to run down his eye, and I guarantee he's talking about guys he went to war with, 
He's talking about a championship football team he played on. He's talking about guys he went hunting with or built cars and raced with. And here's why. Because men bond over activity in the same way that women bond over conversation. Think about it. Here's how you know this is true. Think about a football field. You realize after you score the touchdown, men do things which are absolute violation of man code anywhere else in the universe. Men hug each other publicly. They pat each other on the butt. When, when would this ever be acceptable in any other arena? Why? Why? Because men bond over doing things. Which ladies, and here's, here's a big deal. Which is why when he invites you to go do something with him, no matter how, it's not about whether or not you enjoy it. You probably don't enjoy it any more than my friend enjoys grocery shopping. He's asking you to come be with him in an activity. Which means, ladies, next time, next time he goes, hey, you want to go hunting? And you go, kill animals and skin, what? I'm going to encourage you to go. Even if, even if all you do is hang out at the camper or at the tent and do the cooking, I don't care. Go. Because he's actually inviting you into his world and into his life. It's the same invitation you give when you say, can we go talk? He's saying, will you come be part of this with me? Can I tell you that one of the most powerful things that Lisa has done in my life? She took up golf. She didn't want to golf. She took up golf because she knew that we would spend a couple hours every time in a golf cart together. And I know that every time she golfs with me, it's an incredible act of love. Because in her mind, she goes, well, I could spend that 40 bucks on something else. <laughs> Quality time. Okay? Men. If this is your wife, and if she is someone who receives love and quality time, I'm just going to tell you, that invitation to go for a walk, that, hey, why don't we ever go on dates, she is coaching you. She is trying to, she is saying to you, this is what fills me up. And it's not about what we talk, it's, not, it's just, can we be together? Because this fills up my love tank. So here are some examples. If your spouse is quality time, date night, date night. Lisa and I have a date night every Thursday night. Date night. Couch time. <laughs> I know. Couch time. You just tell the kids, go in the room, kill yourselves. We'll check on you later. <laughs> Mom and I are spending 10 minutes on the couch. Go for a walk. Go for a walk. It's not about exercise. It's about time. Family vacation. If you've got a spouse who's kind of saying, oh, man, I, just, I, I wish we would just go somewhere as a Good chance, quality time. Find an activity they like, join them. They're shooting model rock, I don't care. Join them, quality time. Love language number three, receiving gifts. Receiving gifts. Now guys, here's what you need to get. Men, we, we've got this all wrong, because here's what we think about it. Uh, the bigger the gift, the more credit I get. And so we think to ourselves, hey, I bought her a car. Uh, the payments are five years. I'm good. I'm done. For five years, she knows I love her. And, uh, and, and you and I hear all the time, hey, guy, it, it's not the size of the gift. It's the thought that counts. And in this accord, this is probably true in this moment. Because it's not so much about the gift as it is the thought. Men, maybe, maybe I'm going to help. This is why a lot of women like flowers. Okay, let's just be honest. Flowers die like a day and a half later, and they're kind of expensive. Why not buy one in a little pot and water it? Because at the end of the day, it was the thought. And here was the thought. Before we went on the date, you were thinking about me, and I know that because you had to think about me to go buy me flowers. And that, those flowers sitting in a pot end up being a testimony not only to her heart, but to everybody else who sees the flowers. There is a man who thinks about me when we're not together. It's why it rates. 
It's why it's a big, and, and don't be surprised if e even small little things that you buy or a pair of earrings or buy him a, a bracelet, whatever, all of a sudden end up stuck somewhere where they can be seen and remembered again. Because every time I see it, I remember there is somebody who cares about me. And they become little monuments of affection. That's really kind of the motivation behind receiving gifts. Monuments of affection. And here's another thing that totally blew my mind when I was studying this and getting ready for it. Uh, Chapman argues in here that moments can become monuments of affection. That people who like receiving gifts usually are very, very concerned about big moments in life. So if it's graduation or having a baby or um, a funeral, those moments become especially important to people who receive gifts because here's, here's how they interpret this. You being with me in this all-important moment of my life is a gift of affection. Okay, so it's different. It's different than quality time. Because remember, quality time wasn't around big events. But if you've got a spouse who all of a sudden says, well, there was a funeral and you left early, and that suddenly becomes a huge breach, it's possible that their love language is gifts. Receiving gifts. And the gift they were hoping to receive was your gift of attention and time at that monumental, because maybe another way of saying this is, these are monumental people. They like having monuments of affection in their lives. Okay? All right, and if you happen to think maybe this is someone who's uh, involved in your life. Oh, let me give you an example. My mom, my mom gives affection this way. I, it's interesting because she doesn't necessarily receive affection this way. She gives affection this way. Every Christmas she gives too many gifts. You know anybody like that? gives too many gifts. Well, what's she trying to do? She's trying to say, I love you. And we sit around as kids and we go, Mom, you're crazy. You're going to be paying for some of these gifts for months. I, I, if I wanted to, the truth is, Mom, your kids earn more money than you do. We could have bought these for ourselves. And she doesn't care. It's her expression of her. She wants every time you use that towel. Every time you see that book, she wants there to be a monument of her affection in our lives. I, I've got relatives who, in the midst of horrible financial hardship, buy gifts for other people. What is that? I, I, I'm trying to give a monument of my affection to you. Okay? If you have someone in your life who's like this, here you go. Uh, leaving little gifts for them to find. Very cool thing. They love the idea that in their absence, you were thinking of them. Uh, if, you, if you struggle with this and you're not very good at this, buy several gifts. Put them in a drawer. Wait for the right moment. Remember that key events are usually a big deal to these people. Because remember, it's monuments of affection. And then another one, call in the middle of the day. Because what they're... What they're I was thinking of you when we were apart. Call me in the middle of the day. Create a monument of our affection. Okay? So gift receiving. Love language number four. Here we go. Acts of service. Acts of service. There are people out there who know they are loved when you and I do something for them. And guys, it can be totally mundane. This doesn't have to be some big... It just When you mow the lawn... When you wash the dishes for me, when you vacuum, and I didn't ask you to vacuum, when you do those things, I receive those things. Ladies, you may be in a home and all of a sudden your husband says, I, I, just, I think the house ought to be cleaner. And, you, and sometimes we hear that as deep criticism. It may be that his love language is acts of service. And he comes home and he says, I, I don't think you thought about me all day. Now, he may just be a jerk, so you've got to figure that one out. But <laughs> it could be. Hey, guys, she may have been saying for months, when are we going to paint that room? Or, or when are we, we going to work on the back patio? And you just think she's nagging. It's possible her love language is acts of service. And she's been asking you, not when you would clean the back patio, but when will you express your love to me through acts of service in your life? It's interesting, Galatians, Galatians says this, and I won't make you turn there. It says, bear one another's burdens. In other words, do things for each other and thus express the law of Christ. Which was the law of Christ? Love your neighbor more than yourself. 
And so scripture essentially says there's times in which acts of service on each other's behalf are actually, remember I told you a few weeks ago we were talking and, and Mama Sapora, and I remember I said, she stood up in front and she said, now I know Papa Lynn loves my children because I was in the dormitory working. All the trips I've made to Kenya, all the money that you and I have donated did not mean as much to her as me sitting there with a crowbar taking down panels in the ceiling. Anybody want to guess what Mama Sephora's love language is? Yeah, acts of service. Guarantee it. It's interesting, uh, years ago, I'm a young kid and my parents have divorced and I'd go spend the summers at my uncle's house. And I'd been there for about two and a half years and it occurred to me that I wasn't sure that my Aunt Peggy loved me. And I knew I'd never said it to her, and so remember words of affirmation, big deal to me. And I remember as about a 10-year-old boy sitting there one night and, and thinking, I need to say something to Aunt Peggy. I need to, I need to tell Aunt Peggy that I love her. And so I'm sitting there on the top bunk bed. I knew she'd come in to say goodnight to me. And I, I remember shaking because words of affirmation, big deal. And so finally she came in the room, she said, Lynn, good night, and she turned and she was uh, most of the way out the door, and, and I, I just kind of blurted it out, I just kind of said, Aunt Peggy, I, I love you, I, I really love you. And I remember Aunt Peggy saying, oh, I love you too. <laughs> and in the moment, uh, because words of affirmation are such a big deal to me, I, I was like, wow, deeply disappointed, I mean, deeply disappointed in the moment, I just thought, wow, that, that and I was actually wounded in the moment. It wasn't until years later uh, when I heard this conversation and I went, oh my goodness. My, my Aunt Peggy's love language was acts of service. If you had gone to my Aunt Peggy and said, you know what, your little nephew Lynn, he's not sure that you love, her, love him, he would have said, she would have said, what? For two and a half years, I have brought that boy into my house. I have cooked him meals. I have washed his dirty underwear at two and a half years. And she would have said, if anybody in this world would know that he would, my nephew should know that he's loved. Acts of service. Here's my guess. When I said, hey, Aunt Peggy, I really, really love you. And she said, oh, yeah, I love you too, and walked out in the hall. I bet she walked down the hall and went, if you really love me, carry out the trash. <laughs> Acts of service. If you're married to someone whose who's, uh, love language is acts of service, let me give you some ideas. Listen, there is a really, really, really good chance they've expressed to you what they're hoping you will do. Whether it's painting something, whether it's fixing something, whatever it is, there's a good chance they've expressed it. Okay? If, if you come to the conclusion, oh, I don't think they have and I am, then ask. Ask. Believe it or not, the, the, people with acts of service aren't that offended if you just simply say, what is it I could do? What, what are the things you were hoping I would do for you? Would you give me a list of ten, and would you just write them in priority, because I want to do the most important thing first for you? Acts of service. Do their chore. See, chances are within your marriage, within your relationship, you've kind of navigated and negotiated, this is what you do, and this is what I... Do their do. for them without being asked. They'll go crazy. They'll go, wow, I'm deeply loved. Okay, language number five, here we go. Physical touch, physical touch. And here's what you need to know. This can be non-sexual, in other words, it's just, hey, holding hands, a hand on the shoulder, a hand on the knee when we're together, a hug, physical touch, or it could be sexual. And you know, for some of our spouses, they go, the, the time I feel most loved is within the marriage bed. That's, that's, that's when I feel the most fulfilled and the most is during that sexual encounter. And you need to know that about uh, your spouse. Is it sexual? And then is this what they're waiting for? Is this what they're hoping for? Because if, if their love language is physical touch and it's non-sexual and you try to make it sexual, they're going to go, Whoa, 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 big boy. <laughs> but if it is sexual and you're going, oh, that doesn't matter to me, and they're going to go, no, 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 I, I, rate the, I rate our marriage and how well we're doing by what's happening in the bed. 
because that's my love language on the deal. And, and if that ends up, uh, it's interesting. Um, I think one of my languages may be uh, physical touch, and I uh, was with one of my relatives, and we'd been estranged for years and years and years, and we'd finally kind of gotten together and started to work it out, and, you know, I'm sorry, and, yeah, I know, I kind of blew it too, and we just came to that moment in the conversation where we needed to hug. And, and so I went to my relative, and I started to hug them, and as I went to hug them, they... <laughs> and I remember that moment going, wow. How does anybody in their life know they're loved? I mean, if they're that weirded out and awkwarded, and how would anybody, I mean, wow. And then I realized, it, well, it's because their love language isn't physical touch. I mean, that's, and I guarantee you they've got other ways that they express their love. But here's what you need to know, that, that if you're married to somebody, or if you're in a relationship with somebody, or if you've got a child whose love language is physical touch, dads, let me just say this to you. If your daughter's love language is physical touch, you need to figure out non-sexual ways to fill her love tank. And I know, I know, I know she's 16 now and she's starting to be more like a woman and I know there's moments when maybe that feels a little awkward. Here's what I'm just going to tell you. You have got to figure out non-sexual ways to fill her love tank because if you don't, there's some 16-year-old boy who will. And I'm just going to say to you that if, 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 if this is it, if physical touch is your spouse's love language, and even if you say, look, I just didn't grow up in that type of home, and, and, and we just weren't expressive like that, you just need to know this is, this is a big deal, and I don't care if it feels like you've got you to get past that. Here, here's, a, here's a list of some things you can do. Hold hands. I know, I know it's sweaty, I know it's 115 outside. Hold hands. Touch in public. And here's the thing. I mean, if this, you just need to know, if this is their love language, then chances are they want you to show some level of affection in the open. And you go, oh, this is just so weird for me. I'm, okay. But you're going to have to figure this out. You're going to have to, because this is their, because there's something powerful in their hearts that says, hey, in front of all my friends, you were lovingly put your hands on me or gave me that little kiss. And it meant a ton to me that you did that in front of other people because you said you love me in front of other people. Do this in front of your kids. Walk up behind her and put your arms around her, snuggle up on her neck. You, you know when you've done this right? When your kids go, ooh. Because <laughs> well, here's what you need to know. Right behind the ooh is a little heart that says, I'm so glad Daddy loves my mom. And I'm so glad that mom loves my dad. And you ought to, ooh, your kid's out about once a week. Okay? <laughs> One of the most powerful gifts you give your kids is the knowledge that mom and dad are in love. And then finally, if this is your spouse's love language, and especially if your spouse kind of measures this by what happens in the bed, try initiating sex. Because I'm just going to tell you, this will be a big deal. I, I can't, if, if this is their love language, I guarantee you, okay, and if it is a sexual kind, they have been waiting for you to make the move. And you making the move is like a big, big deal to them. It's an incredible gesture of acceptance to their heart. So here's the deal. Here's what I'm going to ask us to do. <laughs> you and I have been commanded to love. And guys, again, maybe not the most theological conversation we've ever had, but maybe one of the more practical. Because what if, what if? What if you and I have been trying to express love to our spouse and they haven't heard it? And I'm just going to say this. If they're not hearing it, it's not their problem, it's yours. Because you're the one that was commanded to love them. Which means, just like my wife right now is trying to learn Swahili, you have got to learn their love language. It's your job. It's your responsibility to learn theirs. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. It, it, today's over. I'm going to ask you somewhere, go to lunch, sit down somewhere today, 
sit down with your spouse, call up a friend, ask your kids, hey, what do you think my love language is? When you were doing that, when you were in it, what do you think my love language was? And then tell them how wrong they are. And then, and then ask them theirs. Say, here's, here's what I guessed yours was. And don't be surprised, don't be shocked if all of a sudden your spouse tells you something that you did not realize. Because you, you want to hear the interesting thing? You and I tend to love people the way that we receive love, or, number two, we tend to love people the way that our parents taught us. And it's very, very common for people to miss their own spouse. So don't be surprised if they say, this is my love. And you go, oh my goodness, that's why we've been fighting about that. That's why you want me to go to the store and push the cart. Wow. Wow. And then I'm just going to ask you to do this. Ask them for three things, three things they could do, that you could do that they would receive as absolute gestures of love. And then give them three of your own. Okay, let's pray. Hey, dear Lord Jesus, we simply come before you today, and we just, we get it. We get that this is the more practical side of marriage, that you've said, love each other. And that comes down to tangible ways in which my spouse receives my love and says, when, when my husband does this, when my wife does this, when my dad does this, I know I'm loved. And so, God, we're just going to ask that you would maybe even create a new language for us and a new conversation and we'd begin to say, you know, what is your love language and how could I do that for you? How could I best express my love in your life? And that we would take the responsibility on ourselves not to change our spouse's love language, but to learn to speak it to them. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.